Welcome to Strength in the Numbers. My name is Andrew Codd, accountant, author, and commercial finance entrepreneur. And it's my job each week to bring you leaders in finance and business and deconstruct with them their real stories, insights, and hard-won lessons into practical advice on the key strengths and qualities you need to remain relevant in accounting and finance today, as well as the steps you can begin to take to elevate the impact you make to have a fun, successful, and rewarding career in accounting and finance. Now let's go over to the show. Hi everyone and welcome to this week's episode of Strength in the Numbers. Question for you. Is it possible for the finance department to grow a business as much as teams like say sales, marketing or operations? Or are we still guilty of this perception out there that if you're going to grow a company, it's only going to grow through its sales teams? Because if you think about it in this era of data and given the finances access to the data and the decision makers and our full view across the business plus great technical skill to deconstruct a business model and build it back up again you'd think that maybe that perception would have changed but you know what it hasn't however to help us better understand how to answer this question uh, this week's guest mentor brett burgon is a qualified accountant who's led both sales teams and finance teams during his career And he covers some very useful areas for us on today's podcast so that we can start answering this question. So Brett helps us deconstruct uh, the biggest challenge of stepping out of finance into sales leadership roles, but also how we as finance professionals can get more ready to do so. Um, Some great practical advice on how finance professionals can actually get more recognition from our business partners and how we can also better control our own image and also the importance on our, in our careers of mentors. And look, if you did enjoy this episode, please let your friends and your colleagues know about it. We're on all the major platforms such as iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and YouTube. And if you want to check out the show notes, you can also find those at sitnshow.com slash podcasts. Yeah, and I really got on well with Brett, really thought he had such great insights to offer. So really enjoyed our conversation and I hope you benefit from it too, particularly if you're curious to know what it might look like if you were ever to take on a sales role and leverage your finance training to its maximum effectiveness. So look, that's enough for me. Thank you for investing your time with us today. And without further ado, over to Brett and the show. Sure. So I, I started out in public accounting. I thought it was a really great base to, to understand the technical parts of the, of the role and the job. Um, so I did five years in public accounting and, and my focus was on CMA as a, as a designation here in Canada. And, and part of that is just more the M part, which is the management part. So I was always craving to get out into industry and get out of the public world. That was just my focus. And so after five years in public accounting, I jumped into HP, which was really great to, to focus on the business side of things, right? So I did a financial analyst role at HP for five years and then had the opportunity to jump over to um, Cisco Systems. Um, spent most of my last 14 years at Cisco Systems in a variety of roles, including sales. So my last three years, I don't even know if we talked about this last time, Andrew, but my last three years were in partner sales, taking my knowledge of the partner organization that I had um, supporting finance and then moving it into and actually doing a sales role for them in, in business development. When my Cisco career ended, I um, grabbed a, a partner of mine, which is um, Stan Besco, and he was standing on the sidelines looking, what do we really want to do for the rest of our careers? And the answer was very clear. We wanted to help finance professionals develop. We wanted to help finance professionals in their careers. We wanted to take to market all the things we learned over our, our 15 to 20 year career in IT and finance. So we started to be inspired. Which is a great, great name, because I think we could do it a bit of inspiration sometimes in finance and accounting. Uh, but there was actually, I'd love to get on to the work you and Stan are doing, Brett. But before I do, there was a couple of fascinating parts of your career journey. And one that, that some of our listeners might pick up on is that towards the end of your career at Cisco, you had a, was it three years uh, leading sales or uh, in the partner organization and business development there like what what possessed you to go from finance <laughs> into the field into the fire in sales well it, it was it was actually one of these opportunities that would just presented itself so we unfortunately like a lot of finance organizations were getting squeezed a bit at the top and um, you know I was up at the one away from the CFO here in Canada 
were squeezing out the top because of course they wanted to do more with less and save money. And unfortunately, as you know, finance organizations sometimes take the hit with regards to cost reductions. So um, they were looking for volunteers to rotate into other positions. And one came up in the channel uh, world. And so they said, you, would you like to go support um, the IBM strategic outsourcing business and take your knowledge of finance and how to structure deals and how to do these more complex relationships and organizations and take that out and help support Cisco in that way. So it was a good fit because you were able to take some of the finance skills. So those are transferable skills that you, you want to try to build up over time, right? It, it, is, it is interesting because I, I, I can appreciate what you're saying because very similar, I'm, I'm used to working on the deal side and very close to sales. But would I would I voluntarily step into their shoes? Um, probably not. <laughs> but that said, that there's good rewards for doing so. I, I I bet. But in terms of when you did step into their shoes and and take on that role, what was what was the biggest challenge for you, Brett? In terms of you, I know you had transferable skills, but still, what was the biggest challenge for you to overcome? I, I think just the perception that. Uh, you know, quote unquote finance guy is here and, and he's probably just a mole and, and I don't know what he's doing here, but I'm sure he's here to kind of cut off and to, you know, come into the organization and, and to be more of a spy than to contribute to the piece. So I, that, I felt that, right? I, I, I had people kind of had their guard up and their concern. And so I had to prove my value in the fact that I was there for real. I was there to help with the business. Here are my strengths. And also just to keep an open mind that there was stuff I needed to learn to become a better salesperson and to be more integrated into the sales community. So, so yes, yeah, so, but we've already touched already on some of those transferable skills. Um, but in terms of, I suppose, those bits you had to learn to become more integrated, like what, what were they, what did they look like? A lot of it was just relationships. So I, I built some good relationships in my uh, role in finance, but also because you had that, that role in that seat, it's a lot different than jumping into the sales organization and then having to navigate the partner community, the, the, you know, the direct sales team, the, the finance team. Because then, of, of course, I'm on the other side now. So, okay, I need this deal approved, and they're going, you know, can approve the worth, right? And, you know, I, I came from finance, man, you know, trust me. So then I realized, well, wait, I've jumped the shark because now I'm starting to talk like, you know, the sales people. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you moved. Yeah. So um, really, it's just about figuring out how to, to really navigate relationships to take the business knowledge and be able to convert that um, into success. And uh, I, to be honest, I don't think I would have jumped into the direct sales organization. I think the nice fit was the, the partner sales was more of a strategic role, it was yeah. about long term relationships. It's about strategy between a whole bunch of different pieces. And I was able to kind of take that skill set and take it to um, to that role. Yeah, I was just thinking that that could be very good good advice because in a lot of companies, some people call it the indirect channel. So it's it's not you're directly going out in front of customers, but you're actually sort of inserting yourself, making yourself closer to them still. And um, I I that I like the way you you rationalize it. I do think it's. It's actually probably, I mean, I think it's actually probably a good step for anyone looking to go into sales. I suppose if looking back on it, the experience, is there anything you would have done differently or pre pre to prepare yourself for for your, for the journey or advice to our audience thinking about uh, taking a step nearer sales? How could they better prepare? Um, I, I think just the mindset that you, you will add value. I mean, I think a lot of people will doubt themselves, right? A lot of the times you get caught up in your silos of your function and say there's no way I can jump over from finance to operations or finance to sales. And there absolutely is a way. Other than the background and experience, you can check off all the different boxes about, you know, be strategic, learn how to position your company, understand the business, all of these things. As a finance professional, if you're doing it properly, you've already got these check boxes knocked off. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And and you also mentioned about adding value as well. Like, I'm, I suppose there's no accident you've ended up into your current work. So I guess what's exciting you most about what you're currently doing, Brett? Well, I, you know, when we started the company, we looked around at our, our local competitors and um, couldn't really find any, um, which is good and bad. I mean, I, I just think it's a real underserved part of the market. I think there's millions of executive and corporate coaches out there 
they're not focused on finance and and you know we've we brought our experience out to market because we've got that experience, but we also wanted to learn how to do proper coaching and leadership and development from, you know, a, a professional standpoint. Um, so it's, it's, it, it's exciting that it's an underserved part of the market because um, there's opportunity, but it hasn't been a focus area because most of the, the coaching is at the executive level and most of the coaching is uh, maybe sales. So we see opportunity, but I think there's a mindset in the market that you've got to figure out how to really uh, invest in your finance teams, invest in their value, and um, and really kind of take on these these type of engagements. Yeah, that's that's very interesting, and I know that's what a lot of our previous conversation was about. Because I, mean, I think we're very very similar in that regard, Brett. Like finance does need as much care and investment. As as like a front facing sales team, if you look at finance, we've got that great visibility across the business. Where in theory, unbiased, we're meant to be independent. We we help connect the dots. We've access to decision makers. Yeah. The numbers that we report are are simply a byproduct of the relative success of those decisions. And if we can help make those decisions better in any way, we should be driving the numbers. So we play a very important role. It's very much underserved. So I can appreciate why there may not be any direct competitors per se in that space but but like why do you think we find ourselves in this position where it is underinvested perhaps yeah i I just think there's there's a perception that um if you're going to grow the company you grow through sales and uh, i when you look at today's data analytics and you, you actually have that power of the analytics so if you have a finance organization that's just reporting past and that's all they do they're, they're not really contributing towards the future. If you're taking the past and figuring out how to really forecast and uh, change the future and change decisions and add to the strategy, then you're adding that value, right? Then, then you're really contributing towards the, the future of the business. And if the business sees that value, they realize you are actually part of the growth engine. You are actually part of that sales growth engine. And they'll invest in, in you if you if they really see that value and they see the impact, you know, the, why wouldn't you uh, invest in that area? It's just sometimes there's a gap in that perception and sometimes there's a gap in that that actual deliverable. Yeah, no, I, 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 I think I think you're pretty much on the money with that one, Brett. You know, for me, it, it, I think it's sort of how we probably started the conversation in some senses. Finance could be perhaps viewed as an overhead or an expense rather than as part of that growth engine. Yeah. driving sales and more uh, which would be more an asset type uh, mindset to have right. so so i guess that must be quite a big challenge for you to try and navigate um, obviously I'm very excited about the opportunity but trying to navigate that challenge um you know some of our audience would probably be even trying to convince their own leaders uh, to invest <laughs> in their organization in, in the finance team um uh, any tips that uh, practical tips we can perhaps use to uh, to move the agenda forward for everyone in the finance community to try and get that investment or get um, some love i suppose from above yeah i mean, I mean um a lot of it really comes down to what you're delivering and and so make sure you're taking care of your brand for example your your brand can't be the person that shows up and and drops a report off and runs away scurries away right um Make sure your brand is, is the, the person that shows up with a, a report and then has a great strategic conversation about, you know, why are, why are we not investing in this area? How can we create more funds in ROI versus saying we can't afford to do that, right? Should we shift things around? Should we invest in other areas? Like, where is the business going? Having those strategic conversations shows that value. And then absolutely the, the lines of business will want to invest in those people more um, than somebody who drops the report and scurries out as quickly as possible because they're afraid of these conversations, right? So uh, work on your brand, work on your development. Uh, business partnering skills is, you know, 1A and 1B of what you should really be working on because um, really that's where you show your value to the business. The more value you show, the more the business is going to be wanting to invest in you. Actually, that's a really good point. It does come back down to the business, as you said. So like as much as finance, it depends how companies do it, whether finance is a general administration cost or yeah. just in the cost center, the business are the people going out getting the sales. If if they're saying, hang on a sec, we think finance can help us, but to do that, we need to partner with them and show them what we can do. Um, I've definitely been very aware of scenarios where 
the business has actually come to finance leaders and said, we want you to hire specific individuals to help us. Right. Isn't that the best way of doing it, right? Just get the business to pay for it, the sales teams or the, the marketing teams, the go-to-market teams, right? Yeah, and those, I mean, that just proves the value, right? When the sales organizations say, I'll, I'll cut the check, then you know they see the value in that, um, in that deliverable, in that person, that function, right? So... So, so no, I, I think our message really to our listeners is, uh, you know, there is, there is a way, <laughs> albeit it may not feel like it at the moment, but there is a way and there are success stories out there of, of uh, teams cutting the checks of finance resources can go and drive further growth. And um, I, I suppose then in terms of the challenges, the organizations you're working with, um, Brett, like what are their main challenges that they're seeing at the moment in front of them? Well, I, I think a lot of it is um, it's just such a crazy environment sometimes, right? Like we, we have we have clients that um, they're in a, a restructuring every three months now. It used to be every year, it used to be every five years, now it's every three months. So employee engagement is just such a, a critical thing to make sure to focus in on because, um, you know, there's an ax swinging over everybody's head every three months. And how do you focus on your job when you've got an ax swinging over your head? the person beside you get hit with the axe and then you go oh, oh dear. back to work and by the way what's your three to five year development plan right so three to five years oh. you know like, you know it's uh it's the axe is swinging every three months so um all you can do is focus on what you can control so when we talk to our clients and we coach people it's just all, all you can do is make it worse if you disengage and stop delivering value so focus on what you can control focus on delivering that value and focus on your development. And all you could do is make the odds better that you're able to kind of succeed in, in this kind of restructuring environment. And it's across, you know, many different industries and many different organizations. Um, so, uh, you know, do what you can control, show as much value as you can. And it's difficult, right? We, we coach people all the time that are just, we get on the call in the first five minutes, they just have to vent because of what's going on in their business and what challenges they've got and how they are just having problems focusing on real value because of the environment, right? The environment today is, is challenging. Yeah, but but um, but like because it is moving on, like, you know, we have been given a lot of very good skill sets in our training, uh, you know, whether it be compliance, controllership or, or, or advisory. And, and like, you know, the one, one easy way our bread and butter is, you know, business models change, environments change. Therefore, those rules and compliance checks we used to have may no longer be relevant and things might be getting missed. So he, sometimes it could be just going back to basics, right? Or, or developing new relationships, uh, business partnering. Um, uh, you know, you mentioned analytics. There's so much opportunity there, but you made the very important point. It's we need to choose to engage. All right. And, and, and I think that's, that's a key message our audience need to take away is whatever the environment you find yourself in, engage and, and try and create value. And then that will help you find the way, the, the way forward. Is, is there any sort of um, other advice for people in those scenarios? I know many of them who would vent and five minutes be generous, uh, Brett. I could see them going on for an entire session. <laughs> but, um, but you know, just to, you know, to make the best of the situation for themselves and their businesses. Is there any, maybe any other advice you could share? In finance, as you know, you, you come up the ranks, you've got all your focus on technical training and skill training. And unfortunately, there's no real training on things like business partnering, right? And so we've really learned the power of things like uh, self-awareness and working on EQ instead of IQ. So your emotional intelligence today is so much more powerful than we'd ever known. But of course, in our finance professions, no one talks about it. Or they, you know, they kind of slop it off as hippy dippy shit. Um, <laughs> pardon the, uh, the phrase <laughs> but, uh, you know Kevin O'Leary on Shark Tank this kumbaya kind of speak but it, it's it's real um, and just knowing yourself better having a better self-awareness you know managing that self knowing the environment being better socially taking care of these relationships that just really elevates yourself in your profession in your career and, adds, and it does that value. You build a relationship with a sales leader and actually have one-on-one -on -one strategic conversations. That does many things. It protects you, it actually elevates you, and it opens up doors to opportunities, right? I've, I've seen finance leaders go in to be the VP of operations because they have seen the, the field of play, as you might call 
right? They understand the sales, they understand finance, and they can understand the, the links and the proper connection points between those. Um, you know, I, I've seen people, of course, jump into sales. I've seen people kind of rotate across different organizations. And all these different things sometimes are built on relationships. Sometimes it's just built on your approach and your mental approach. That, that's that's great advice. That's great advice. I, and I suppose, look, you've been giving us really, really uh, good advice for our careers, uh, Brett, and, and, and how to navigate the current environment. I suppose in terms of yourself, what's been the best bit of advice you've ever received? I, I went for a promotion once. Um, way back in the day and I, I was all excited because I, I thought I had built myself a, a resume of accomplishments and I had all these accomplishments down and I was ready to talk about these accomplishments. And two minutes into the meeting, uh, I was basically being laughed at because um, I was told, listen, you could be curing cancer, but nobody knows about it. You know, if, if you have cured cancer, nobody knows. And uh, what's the point if nobody knows about it right so I learned very early on about um, it, it, it's difficult for finance people to stand up and you know kind of trumpet like I've done this this and this but it is important um, to make sure that your accomplishments are known and to make sure that your value to the business and what you've done and what you've discovered and what you might add to the strategy can actually be shared across your organization I had assumed my manager at the time because I was junior was doing that but she wasn't, right? Um, so when I went for this promotion, I was laughed out of the room because no one had any exposure to any of my work that I've done. And um, to them, it was kind of comical. It's, it's basically like the water boys come off the bench and he wants to be head coach. You know, they just, it, it was the perception at the time. So my advice really is about making sure you kind of work on your brand and some of that branding work is done through have, making sure you get exposure to the right individuals in the business so that they can see your work and they can see your value. Definitely. I, that's great advice. And I, I'm going to add a little bit to it, um, Brett, that I've learned from a lot of these smaller businesses I've worked with. Uh, and, and also when I was in sales as well was always ask for a referral. So you go and do some good work for a business leader, yeah. ask for them to write you a testimonial or send an email to your line manager. Uh, you know, I, I remember a staff there who got six recently on a recent business trip. And um, needless to say, that person has got their promotion because the, the business uh, gave them the referrals, gave them, yeah. put the necessary pressure on the line management to, to make sure this person was, was valued in the organization. And, uh, you know, even in the, the business paid for it. So, so, you know, definitely ask for referrals. And, um, and and keep a value log of of the value you're adding and the potential value you could add. It's just coming back to your your saying, Brett, of self awareness, which is great advice. Uh, being aware of yourself and the environment around you. So um, that's fantastic advice. And, and and I suppose in terms of should our our, our audience want to check out any resources that you you found useful um, in the past, what what resources would you re recommend to our audience? Well, I I think. Um... I think mentors are the, the greatest resource you can have because um, anyone listening could, can take this on and say, well, um, either I have a mentor and it's working great or, you know, what's a mentor and how, what's the power of it? So I, I we always mandated uh, back to the last company I was at, we mandated that you have a mentor within the finance organization, but also a mentor outside the finance organization. That's the most knowledge you can get of yourself and also of where you stand in the organization and the value to the organization. You can be pumping out reports all day. If you don't have someone on the other side actually being honest and saying valuable and that they're using it, then you're just, you know, you, you might be wasting a lot of your time, right? So um, it, it's really critical to have mentors while you're developing. And as I said, I think it's great to have it within your function, but also outside your function to give you that outside perspective. That, that's a great, I, you know, maybe that's a challenge we should set for our audience, right? Is to make sure you have a mentor, you know, don't, don't wait around, go, go, go find a mentor in your function and find one outside. And, and the great thing is, is um, I think a lot of people who have found their ways to leadership positions um understand the value they receive from mentors and more than likely will give it back to you 
um, they will invest the time in you. So don't be frightened. Um, nothing to be frightened on. No, pe people take it as a compliment that you're there to actually learn from them. And, um, you know, I, I, I've never really seen anyone turn it down, um, especially if you pick the right mentor and, and you build that relationship out. It's, it's really invaluable. So I'm glad you've, you've challenged the audience to, to really go out there and to, uh, take charge of that. Yeah, I, I, by the way, I want to make sure people uh, let, let us know how it goes. All right. And if they're having any difficulty, please reach out. We can, how do you say, uh, help help guide you on what you need to do on that one. That's, that's, that's so important. So great advice again, Brett. I suppose in terms of if any of our audience wish to continue the conversation with you, where's the best place to connect with you at? Uh, well, my email is brett at beinspiredfinance.com. And um, you can just call my direct line if you want it. The hotline's open, you know, 416-883-2409. So, um, you know, that we just find when we make a direct connection with um, with a client or with someone in, folk, uh, in finance, um, being able to kind of personalize it to what they're going through is really the power of, of our business, right? It's not just generically standing up and, and lecturing. Uh, we're not a university. We're there to kind of actually pull the answers out of our clients and to help them. Um, with what they're going through and what they're working on and what their aspirations are. Um, so the only way to do that is really to have that direct contact. With them. Completely agree. Uh, I suppose, Brett, then, look, we, we've covered a lot, but I, I, again, I want to be respectful of your time, but also make maximum value for our audience uh, as we got you here as a guest mentor. So maybe any other parting thoughts before we wrap up for our audience? Um, I, I just... You know, one analogy that I don't think we've covered today, but um, it's going back to how the industry is focused. It's, it's really focused on people once they kind of get to the top, right? It's focused on executives. It's focused on leaders, help, helping them and coaching them. But we're, we're asking these finance professionals to figure out how to climb Everest on the road, right? Maybe we'll check in every year. Um, hey, uh, here's your annual review. You, did great, you know, you didn't miss any reports and you showed up to work and whatever, and go back to work, right? Um, that's not coaching, that's not real peer development, that's not a development plan, um, that's not mentoring, it's not any of those things, right? And then we say, well, when you get to the top of Everest, then we'll actually invest in your real development. But if you really want to have a, an organization with strong leaders, you've, you've got to invest in them as they kind of take that journey. They'll climb Everest faster, they'll be stronger when they get at the top, and what you've really done is create that next generation of leader. I, we're seeing this as an underserved part of the market because it's 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 not common practice, unfortunately. Right? There are people out there doing it, which you know, kudos to them. Um, but if you kind of take that analogy to heart, it, it's really time to invest um, in um, in that kind of that journey and in, investing in coaching and helping and developing these people along that journey. So there you have it. Hope you enjoyed today's show. If you'd like to know more about our guests today, their bio, and follow up on the resources mentioned during the show, you can find all the relevant links and more at sitnshow.com. There you'll also be able to get access to earlier shows, read the latest blogs. There's also an opportunity to subscribe to our newsletter, which will give you heads up as to when the next show is coming out, latest events, news, and anything that's going to be relevant to help you have a fun, rewarding, and successful career in finance and accounting. And just before you go, we really appreciate your feedback. If there's something we can do better on the show, something that's not working, or something you'd like to see, even a guest you'd like for us to invite onto the show, someone who you think might be able to benefit you more and also the rest of our community, please let me know. You can email me. I'm at andrew at sitnshow.com or feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. Just drop me a message so I know how you found me and we can connect. And really, it's our community that will make the show. If we keep engaging and driving each other on, we'll keep on building our strength in the numbers. And when all is said and done, if we can do the numbers better and finance better, we'll create more opportunities for ourselves, our friends, our families, our communities and our businesses. So until next time, have a good rest of the week. Take care and let's keep building our strength in the numbers. 